And I tell you, more than anything, I want to see some people with some spiritual guts. I want to see people that will say, I am not ever going to give up. Because you know what? Giving up is so easy. You say, I am never going to give up. I am going to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to be what God wants me to be. I'm going to have what God wants me to have. And I'm just telling you that it's going to, going to take time. One of the reasons why we do the things that we do is because we're not just a one part being, we're three parts. And all three parts can talk, be talking to us at the same time and it gets a little confusing. You are number one a spirit. God is a spirit being. You are first and foremost a spirit being. You have a soul and you have a body. Now your soul and your body are referred to in the Bible as the flesh. And your spirit is referred to as the spirit. Your spirit is where God comes to dwell when you receive Christ as your Savior. He cleans that all up, makes it holy. By his own miracle working grace. Because he can't dwell anywhere that's not holy. So when you're born again, all of a sudden, you have a new moral code on the inside of you. We no longer have to live according to the law like they did under the Old Testament, but we still do have the law. It's just that it's now written in our hearts. The Holy Spirit becomes our new law, and it becomes a law of freedom because it's no longer something we have to do. God, when he comes to live in us, gives us a new want to. So one part of you just wants so much to do what's right. The Spirit is willing, Matthew 26, 41 says, but the flesh is weak. We still have the flesh. We still have our old mind, our old emotions, our old will, and the same old stingy, lazy, selfish, self-centered body. And they very frequently get in the way of this new thing that's going on inside of us. So it's no wonder that we don't understand ourselves, especially in the early days of our walk with God, because, for example, before you receive Christ as your Savior, you could sin and be comfortable with it. It didn't bother you at all. All of a sudden, when you receive Christ, now you're not comfortable doing some of the things that you used to do anymore. All of a sudden, things start to bother you. That didn't bother you before and you're not even really sure that you understand why because you haven't been educated enough yet to get it all. So then although part of you knows what's right to do, the other part is pressing you to still do what's wrong or to still just do what's a habit for you. You haven't learned new habits yet. You haven't learned how to think right yet. So then you go ahead, although you want to do what's right, you do what's wrong and then here comes the guilt and the condemnation that's heaped on you which then keeps you from growing and changing. So it just becomes a never-ending downward spiral of a treadmill that Satan gets us on. The Apostle Paul talked about this situation in Romans 7. He said, the thing I want to do, I can't do. The thing I don't want to do, I'm always doing. What's wrong with me? Well, if I do it, but I don't want to do it, it must not really be me doing it, but it's a new, you know, it's my flesh doing it. So I've got one law at work in my spirit, another law at work in my flesh. And man, until you get mature enough in the Lord to understand what he's saying, it can scramble your brains. I remember trying to read Romans 7 30 years ago and going. But I actually believe that Romans 6, 7, and 8 are like pivotal chapters in the Bible. It's kind of like if you don't get around to understanding Romans 6, 7, and 8, then there's a lot of things in your walk with God that are just never, ever, ever going to make any sense to you. For example, in Romans 6, it says that those of us who are in Christ have died to sin. Now, it doesn't say sin died. Oh, sin is still very much alive and well on planet Earth. It's still out there tempting us. Actually, the Bible says temptation must come. That's why God's given us 
the fruit of discipline and self-control because even when temptation comes we don't have to get into the temptation we can say no by the power of God let's practice say no we got a few people back there that mean what they're saying and so because we don't understand ourselves and we don't really understand what's going on although one part of us wants to do what's right there's another part coming against us to do what's wrong sin isn't dead but there's a part of us that's dead to it there's a part of us that doesn't want anything to do with doing the wrong thing that's the part of you that's been made right with God through the blood of Jesus Christ as a gift of his grace he that knew no sin became sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ now why does God give us that gift right away at the very beginning this is why God never expects you to produce anything that he doesn't give you in your life so God first shows us forgiveness then he expects us to forgive one another God shows us unconditional love then he expects us to show others unconditional love he gives us mercy then he can say to us now I want you to be merciful he gives us righteousness then he can say to us now I want you to do the right thing he never requires us to do the right thing without giving us righteousness so you and I have the ability to do what's right we have the ability to love we have all the fruit of the Spirit on the inside of us but they come as a seed everything in the kingdom of God works on the law of gradual growth first a seed then you water the seed then you work with God to keep the weeds away from the seed then you let the sun shine on the seed it grows a little bit and really for a while it seems like nothing's happening because before you see anything on top it's taking root downward we have to get rooted and grounded in the love of God the Bible says we have to get rooted and grounded in the Word of God in Mark chapter 4 it talks about four different kinds of soil that receive the seed and one of them is, is the kind that gets all excited right away and says yes 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 that's wonderful I agree but it says it has no real root and so when trouble or persecution comes on account of the word it's immediately offended and falls away that's the person who can sit in church and clap and clap and cheer about the miracles that God's going to give but they don't really want to hear too many messages about spiritual maturity and obedience and sacrifice and going through things and so they're all yay 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 for the good stuff but then when persecution or trouble arises why on account of the word you think the devil's just going to roll out a red carpet and clap for you because you've decided to learn the word of God and be a Christian and get out in the world and represent God no you're going to be tested you're going to be tried the enemy's going to come against you you're going to be persecuted <laughs> oh, come on you, you don't if you smile I'll preach better I've gotten persecuted for doing what I'm doing the Bible says that these are things that are going to come on account of the word and if people have no real root then the first thing they get is offended well why is this happening to me well I don't understand why this is happening to me if it happens to somebody else stay strong brother <laughs> hallelujah you know God is faithful now just keep a good attitude and press right through oh but when it happens to us so getting roots takes time bearing good fruit takes time well the symptom of the flesh that we want to talk about today is being impatient and hasty the flesh has one thing to say when it's trying to get somewhere are we there yet 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 when God when when God when <laughs> in church we can sing my times are in your hands 
You ever tried to take a long trip with a little kid? I mean, isn't it torture? I mean, you bring all this ton of stuff to entertain them, and it doesn't take them very long, and they've just made the trip through all of it. Are we there yet? 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 Well, you know what? We sound the same way to God. And I would imagine that Him trying to travel somewhere with us from our baby stage of Christianity to full maturity is torture just like it is for us to try to take a long trip with two or three little kids in the back seat. So we have to understand today that impatience is a fruit of the flesh and true godly patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience. Now, patience is not just an ability to wait. I, I'll give you a little understanding today that you may not know. You're going to wait. Doesn't matter whether you want to or you don't, whether you like it, whether you don't, whether you wait well, whether you wait bad. None of that matters. Waiting is a fact of life. There's nobody that can get pregnant and have the baby the next day. And we get pregnant with all kinds of things. We get pregnant with ideas and creativity and dreams and visions for our life. And pregnancy starts with a seed and then it goes through stages. Some are a little more exciting than others. And the one that is the least exciting is called transition. It's the most painful, but it's the one that comes right before the birth. That's the stage that a woman thinks is going to surely kill her. <laughs> and that's when the doctor won't say anything but push. And you think, you idiot, if I push one more time, I'm going to tear myself wide open. Do not tell me to push. <laughs> I don't know what stage of pregnancy you're in. In your dream and vision or your spiritual maturity or, or whatever it might be. But I'm going to tell you that it just simply takes time. God works on the law of gradual growth. I would not even know how to begin to tell you all the different phases and stages that I've gone through. To get from where I started. To where I am. And I personally am very disturbed by all the people who give up in the middle. Starting is not hard. Your emotions will help you start. Whee! New thing. Yeah! And everybody thinks your idea is good. Oh, yeah! Sounds good, brother. Sounds good, sister. Yeah, go for it. And then that's the last you see of them because they ain't going to help you. Sooner or later, you're going to end up with just you and God and your dream and your pain. <laughs> and you're going to be the one that's going to have to decide if you're going to go through or if you're going to give up. Amen. Dave and I have been married 44 years. Well, We were talking yesterday, coming here on the plane with our daughter, and I mean, I've already told Dave, I said, if God takes you before me, there is no way that I would ever get married again. <laughs> Not because I don't have a great marriage, but I ain't going through that again. <laughs> yeah. The Bible says, and a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That sounds so sweet. <laughs> but I tell you, the becoming is a nightmare. Trying to blend two lives together and get two very totally different people to blend them together and then to be able to say, we have total peace. <laughs> I mean, you better have some of God in you if that's going to work. <laughs> and Dave said, I would never go through that again. <laughs> well, that doesn't mean that we're not, we love each other, we're happy that we're married. But I'm going to tell you, worst, 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 you know, when I say we've been married 44 years, everybody claps. But you know what? The only reason why we're still here today is not because we never felt like giving up. There were times when we felt like throwing the towel in. I'm sure there were times when, when Dave wanted to quit and give up on me in the early years. There's been things that I've went through where I thought, I can't stand it if he doesn't change. I can't do this. He doesn't. And you know, then I finally just said, you know what? I'm going to look at the good stuff. 
Because even if you think the grass is greener on the other side, you're going to have to mow that grass too. It's not going to be perfect. So anything that you have that somebody's clapping about now, come on now, anything that you have in your life now that people are clapping about now and you've got a smile on your face about, it didn't come free and it didn't come easy and it didn't come quick. And I tell you more than anything, I want to see some people with some spiritual guts. I want to see people that'll say, I am not ever going to give up. Because you know what? Giving up is so easy. You say, I am never going to give up. I am going to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to be what God wants me to be. I'm going to have what God wants me to have. And I'm just telling you that it's going to, going to take time. Now, we all know that one of the biggest problems we have is getting out there and starting something in the flesh. Trying to make something happen that only God can make happen. Proverbs 21, verse 5. The thoughts of the steadily diligent tend only to plenteousness. But everyone who is impatient and hasty hastens only to want. Proverbs 29, 20. Do you see a man who's hasty in his words? <laughs> There's more hope for a self-confident fool than for him. <laughs> now, one of the things that happens when we're too hasty with our words is we make commitments that we have not even considered whether or not we can keep them. We do it in the height of emotion. Whoo! I use the example of a 4th of July sparkler. Man, they start off with a bang. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, <laughs> well, that's exactly the way the flesh is. We can get so excited. Make a commitment. Oh, yes. Praise the Lord. You can count on me. Yes. I'll do that. Woo. Hallelujah. Going on a diet Monday. <laughs> Going to start working out next year. <laughs> Whatever it is. You know, going to get out of debt. Amen. And then we make a commitment. But we spoke without thinking. We spoke without counting the cost. We spoke without even thinking about how long is this going to take? How hard is this going to be? I had no idea what I was getting into when I said yes to God when he called me to do this. And I guess in some ways it's good that we don't have any idea what we're getting into because if any one of us could see our whole life from right now forward, we'd probably just say, beam me up, Scotty. I'm like, Ain't no way I'm doing that. I'm out of here. But we all know by experience that most things take longer than we thought it would cost more than we ever thought we could pay and was harder than we ever thought that we could bear. Amen? Amen? I mean, I mean, even having a baby. I mean, people who've never had a baby. Oh, they're just so excited that they're going to have a baby. <laughs> Man, when they're giving birth, I would never do this again. Anybody who would do this has to be stark raving mad. Then you get the baby. It's like, oh, well. <laughs> then you go do it again. <laughs> because the end result is worth the pain. Amen. I said the end result is worth the pain. <laughs> do you have any idea today how glad I am that I didn't give up on what God had called me to do. Oh my gosh. When I think about all the places in my life that were so hard and, and how I just wanted to say, forget it. But I'm so glad I didn't do that because now I'm living in the reward. What man 
starts to build a building, the Bible says in Luke 14, without first counting the cost to see if he has what it takes to finish. I want to see more people that will go through the process, even though it takes much longer than you would like it to take. And I really want to see Christians be a model to the rest of the world. Let us, if they can't say anything else about us, let them at least say they do what they say they're going to do. And part of the thing that has to happen for us to do that is we have to start not being so hasty to speak, but to actually think about what we're saying and what we're committing to, to make sure that we're going to be ready to pay the price to fulfill it. Proverbs 20, 21, an inheritance hastily gotten by greedy, unjust means at the beginning, in the end will not be blessed. Now, you know what one of our hugest problems is in society today? Everybody wants instant gratification. I want it now. I deserve it now. I should have it now. I mean, honestly, people go to work at a company and they're all upset if after six months they don't have all the vacation pay and all the benefits and all the salary that it used to take somebody 25 years to work up to. And that's why there's so little appreciation in the world today. Because you can't appreciate anything that you didn't work for to get. We're not entitled to stuff. We're not just entitled to something without putting out the effort that we should put out to have it. Some of these attitudes that have gotten into our society are actually going to ruin the whole moral fiber of our nation if we don't wake up and smell the roses and realize that it's only through diligent hard work, praying, waiting on God, doing the right thing, sometimes for a long period of time before you get the right result, that you can ever be really fulfilled and have what God really wants you to have. The law of gradual growth, little by little. The Bible says God delivers us from our enemies little by little. And actually it says, lest the beast of the field increase among you. That's in Deuteronomy 7:22. He de delivers us from our enemies little by little, lest the beast of the field increase among you. You know what I believe that beast is? Pride. I think when we get everything and have to make no effort, then all of a sudden we start thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Now we deserve everything. Well, why should I, you know, well, why should I have to wait for anything? I deserve it right now. Well, what did you do to deserve it? Well, <laughs> and then pride comes in and we can't be thankful and we can't be grateful. And then we just expect more and more and more and more and still don't have the ability to be thankful for anything. You have no idea how thankful Dave and I are. Oh, my gosh. My, my, my. I remember when I would go out. We pulled in here last night. I mean, the traffic was everywhere. You couldn't hardly. We're thinking, are we going to get a parking place? Are we going to get in the building? And You know, instead of letting that go to my head and think, oh, well. My, my. <laughs> Somebody said, oh, man, look at all these people. And I said, you know what? I remember right now a meeting that I did. There were nine people, and I brought five of them with me. Yeah. And that, you know, that's when it's important to remember where you came from. Remembering where you came from makes you thankful and grateful. I remember when Dave and I couldn't afford to stay in a hotel at night when we would go out and speak. And we would drive part of the way and he'd get too tired to drive the rest of the way to get home. And we'd pull over into a parking lot. And he'd sleep 30, 45 minutes. 
and then he'd drive some more. I'm glad for those days. I'm glad for those days when I had to get all my kids' clothes at garage sales, and I had to believe God for my dish rags and wash rags. I'm glad for those days because now it makes me appreciate where I'm at. Don't ever despise the day of small beginnings. And don't ever think that you should be the one who doesn't have to go through that. God allows us to go through those things and think, and we need to thank Him for it because that's where we mature. That's where we grow up. Not by instant gratification, getting everything that we want the moment that we want it, and not ever having to wait on anything. Why shouldn't you have to wait? You need to plan to wait. Well, we're often in a big hurry, but God is not. He's more concerned with developing the fruit of patience in us. And over time, we find that waiting patiently with a good attitude has far better results than instant gratification. Today, I'm trying to help you understand why you do some of the things that you do. I know for me, I've wondered sometimes, why in the world do I act that way? It's not even the way I want to act. Why do I act that way? And I believe that understanding yourself better can really help you. Conditions of what we saw here just absolutely broke Shelly and Mai's heart. There was no water. People would have to walk for hours and hours one way to get dirty water. There was no education. And so we started planning and, and asking how can we make a difference in this. And so today we're here and we have just dedicated one of five wells that we've dug in this area. And these are not just wells. They're solar paneled with pumps and they have reservoirs of 10,000 liters and they will just change this whole community. And we've dedicated a primary school that will, will do grades one, two, three, four, five. So we've literally changed this entire community uh, here in Tanzania. And we just couldn't do it without you. So we're so grateful. The people are so appreciative. And we say thank you and God bless you. worden we door vele stemmen, gedachten en meningen overspoeld. Hoe kunnen we erachter komen wat God ons door bepaalde levensvragen en dagelijkse uitdagingen zeggen wil? Joyce Meyer legt in dit boek uit op welke verschillende manieren God met je kan communiceren. Bestel nu hoe je Gods stem kunt horen telefonisch op 026 20 22 100 of bezoek onze website joyce-meyer.nl Ga ook eens naar de Facebookpagina van Joyce Meyer Nederland. Like deze pagina en ontvang elke dag inspirerende uitspraken van Joyce op jouw Facebook. Open, direct en to the point. Kleine oases in je dagelijks leven. Lees mee, het is het waard. Alleen bij Joyce Meyer Nederland op Facebook.